Ashley and I'm back with a new video and uh, I've been kind of on hiatus. If you see my latest video, you'll know that I have a boyfriend now and I did a video with him uh, answering 10 relationship questions. I'll leave a link uh, up above if you want to check that out. But I'm back to regularly posting. I also restarted my weight loss journey and I also have already repost or posted that video and I'll leave a link for that if you're interested in that as well. So to start off 2021, I'm going to be doing a reaction video to What Culture, which if you didn't know is like one of my favorite channels. They have a whole bunch of different types of uh, topics for different channels. They have a gaming one, which I recently subscribed to, uh, a horror one, and then just a regular one in general. So this one's just their regular channel, and it's going to be talking about Scott Pilgrim. And if you have not seen that movie, it is a cult classic, and I highly recommend it. It has uh, Michael Sarah. Uh, Sexy Chris Evans. Um, I can't think of the girl that plays Ramona, but she's pretty awesome too. And there are other people in it that are, they might not be totally like, ooh, popular, but they're like, if you like quirky movies, you've probably seen them in it. Um, so I'm gonna do a reaction to 20 things you didn't know about Scott Pilgrim versus the world. And if you're interested in finding out what these things are, or if you already knew what they are, then just keep watching. As certified box office for Bomb on release a decade ago, Scott Pilgrim vs. The World has since become the cult classic it was always destined to be. There's just so much to see in Scott Pilgrim that you really need to go back and rewatch it again and again though to spot everything. Which, judging by its paltry $48 million box office haul, very few people actually did at the time. Never fear though, because we've gone back through the movie which humbly describes itself as an epic of epic epicness to pick out all the references in jokes and background details that you may have missed the first time or indeed the tenth time <laughs> around. I'm That's Ramona Flower. Hours, if you haven't These seen the movie, things you didn't know about Scott Pilgrim the girl with the, the teal world. hair. And number 20, it was inspired by Brian Lee O'Malley's wife's exes all having the same name. Talking <laughs> to a new partner about their exes isn't always a great conversation. But in the case of Scott yeah. Pilgrim creator Brian Lee O'Malley, it provided him with the germ for his most successful idea. It was upon hearing that his then wife, comic book artist Hope Larson, had previously dated three guys named Matthew that O'Malley conceived of having to battle a league of evil Matthews to win her over. <laughs> this is then what developed into the Scott Pilgrim Comics' League of Evil Exes. In fact, I love it. <laughs> How hilariously iconic, iconic, ironic is it? All of them were named Matthew. And it's freaking amazing. She's a comic book. She's a comic book author. The name of Ramona's first evil ex, Matthew Patel, is a tribute to this earlier old Matthew concept, and the surname <laughs> Patel is borrowed from graphic designer Harsh Patel, who designed the comics title font as well. Ooh. Number 19, the character names are tributes to Canadian music. For the fight with the first evil ex, Matthew, Scott is wearing a shirt with the logo Plum of tree. the 90s indie band Plum Tree. This is Plum a tree. reference to the Canadian power pop axe 1998 single Scott Pilgrim, from which O'Malley took the character's name. Huh. I've never heard of any of those <laughs> people or things. The song itself was originally about a guy named Scott Ingram, hence Scott's rival and the third evil ex being named Todd Ingram. However, Scott's not the only character whose name references Canadian music. His band's hanger on Young Neil has a name that's an inversion of Canadian rock legend Neil Young. 
while set for bomb for Man Steven Stills, shares a name with Young's American former bandmate from Crosby Stills Nash and Young. Ramona Flowers, oh. meanwhile, isn't actually named after a band, but there is a band named after her. The Bristolian indie five piece, the Ramona Flowers. I've actually seen them live at a festival and can confirm they have some certified bangers. Number 18, Lucas Lee's are movies they? are also named after Plum Tree songs. When Scott goes to confront Ramona's second evil ex, Lucas Lee, he's actually on the set of his new movie. The film is titled You Just Don't Exist, which is the name of a single from Plum Tree's 1998 album, Predicts the Future. Disappointingly, though, Plum Tree have never recorded a song called Action Doctor, even though a chorus based on the tagline, The good news is you're going to live, the bad news is he's going to kill you, would <laughs> be instantly number one hit worthy. Number 17, the bands are all named after classic Nintendo. Who is USAA made for? It's made for him, a veteran. Who honorably served. And it's made for her. She's serving now. We also made USAA for military spouses and their kids. Become a member. Get an insurance quote today. Nintendo games. If it's not Canadian indie pop, that's the source for names in Scott Pilgrim, and you can be sure it's old school console games instead. Scott's band Sex Bomb, of course, takes Sex its name from the cute little anthropomorphic point mm -hmm. of bombs in various Mario games. Envy and Todd's next big thing act called The Clash of Demon Head, though, is a reference to a 1989 demon blasting platformer of the same name. While the purveyors of the shortest it. tunes in a rock, Crash and the Boys, are also named after an NES game. The final showdown with Gideon happening in the Chaos Theater is all also a Nintendo reference, as that's the name of a location in cult favorite SNES role-playing game, Earthbound. Number 16, Edgar Wright's brother designed the 8-bit Universal logo at the start. The 8-bit logo awesome. at the start of the movie, not even the only joke in Scott Pilgrim to use the Universal fanfare, was something of a family project as the animation was designed and produced by Edgar Wright's big brother, Oscar. An animator and artist, Oscar worked on the storyboards and title designs for both his brother's previous films at the time, which were Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz. Oh, well, he's cool will fun. recognize his brother's work in the plot holes extra feature <laughs> on those movies to be as well. Oscar was also That's a concept hard. designer and storyboard artist for Scott Pilgrim and was responsible for replicating O'Malley's art style in the movie's animated sequences. Number 15, everybody in the movie is under 30 except the vegan police. Perhaps it shouldn't surprise people that Scott Pilgrim didn't reach audiences across all age groups. Given that the movie has an aversion to over 30s that is positively Logan's Run-esque. Literally every character who gets a name and a credited actor is aged somewhere between the youngest cast member who was Brie Larson who turned 20. Oh, that's Brie Larson. Larson? I didn't know that was her. Police, and the oldest, Brandon Routh, who turned 30 at the same time. So with that in mind, why should anyone born <laughs> before 1980 really get the movie? Amongst a young cast of 20-somethings, Michael Sarah was actually younger than the 22-year-old character that he played, as well as being younger than Ellen Wong, who played his still-in-high-school girlfriend. The one exception to Scott existing in a world of perpetual arrested development is the uncredited cameo from Clifton Collins Jr. and the erstwhile Punisher Thomas Jane. Number 14, Bill Hader does all the video game voiceovers. One further exception to Scott Pilgrim's no over 30s rule was Saturday Night Live's Bill Hader. Cause it's cool now, shit. Thinking, you might not remember actually seeing the future IT star anywhere in the film, but that's because you didn't miss him, as he actually doesn't appear on screen, nor does he play a named character. Instead, Hader, who at the time was known for a lot of voice work in the likes of Cloudy with a Chance I want to do voice work so bad. As the voice. Basically, any Somebody. voiceover anywhere in the film. <laughs> but give me an opportunity. <laughs> voiceover at the start of the flick to the video game announcers. Number 13, the sound cues are a link to the past, literally. It should come as no surprise that Scott Pilgrim is packed with video game sounds yes, as a triumphant KO when Scott defeats Gideon, which is taken directly from Street Fighter Alpha 3. More than any other gaming classic though, it is the Legend of Zelda that most influences Scott Pilgrim's soundscape. As soon as Hader's voiceover introduces our hero, the movie transitions into further setting up the characters with a whole heap of Zelda sounds. Scott and Waltz's home appears to the intro music from the SNES Zelda game, A Link to the Past, while the whistle from the 
the N64's Ocarina of Time sounds as a caption pops up with Scott's stats. Number 12, hmm. in a reversal of its own plot, it was almost shot and in I wasn't into Zelda, so I didn't know that. In the scenes on location for Lucas Lee's movie, there is an Empire State Building backdrop, a joke about how Toronto is in constant use as a film set, but only to play more iconic American cities <laughs> and never itself. However, Scott Pilgrim only ended up using the real Toronto as a location because Wright insisted on it. He felt that the particular chilled, and chilled as in cold is what I mean there, atmosphere of Canada's biggest city was integral to the feel of O'Malley's world. Not only did Wright make use of Toronto landmarks like Lee's Palace, Casa Loma, and the Pizza Pizza chain, but he also shot on the same unremarkable everyday streets that had inspired O'Malley's original art in the comics. Number 11, the art direction is full of X symbols. Just as in his Cornetto trilogy, Wright loves filling the visuals of his movies with <laughs> it's been a while since I've seen and it. sight gags. So in this movie all about evil exes, the letter X can be found pretty much wherever oh, you look. When Ramona oh, gives Scott X's a number, for example, she writes seven kisses beneath, which of course is also seven X's for the members X's. of the League of Evil X's. X's frequently feature on characters' costumes, such as the X-Men patch on the sleeve of Scott's jacket, and the twin X's on Lucas Lee's belt buckle. Even the backgrounds are full of X's, though. Street signs are the show X's for crossings, and early in the movie, Scott and Knives are showing walking through the snow, where the clear tracks make an X shape. Number 10. The evil X's all have their numbers attached. On top of all the X's that can be spotted throughout the movie, each of Ramona's evil X's come with an enormous amount of references to their number in the story. This is at its most obvious when Scott faces off against evil X number 3, Todd, who comes wearing a shirt with a giant number 3 on the front, but can also be seen in the costumes of all the others. Matthew Patel has a red chevron on his sleeve, which looks like a 1. Lucas Lee has a tattoo of a symbol for 2 on his neck. Rory Richard has 4 ripped in her stockings, and the Katianagi twins have figures representing five and six on their cuffs. The seventh and final Evil X Gideon, though, this numerology really goes into overdrive. The Chaos Theater is on level seven, Scott is attacked by seven guards, and earns 700 points every hit he lands. Gideon oh. then swallows his gum and cites the myth that it will take seven years <laughs> for it to digest. Number nine, I thought it was Scott 10. is associated with the number zero, except at one vital point. While the movie's numerology associates all of Ramona's X's with a different digit, Scott gets a number of his own zero. zero. There is, however, another numbered shirt that Scott wears later in the movie. After a battle with fourth X Roxy Richer and a quarrel in which he and Ramona break up, Scott can be seen in a shirt with a Fantastic Four logo on, Word. only with a half like added that. in next oh. to the four. This is a direct lift from the same outfit that Scott wears at that point in the comic, which represents the idea that at this moment in time, he's only half a step away from becoming an evil ex himself. Number 8. Ramona's costume pays tribute to her dead brother. In order to help the cast better understand their characters before production began, Wright's co-writer Michael Bacall used O'Malley's notes to write little crib sheets of ten secret things about <laughs> each one. For instance, Aubrey Plaza has said that her insight into her character's backstory meant that she played Julie as having a secret crush on Scott, which she is angry at not being returned. On the other hand, Ramona's actress Mary Elizabeth Winstead revealed that part of the emotional damage which made her character into who she was today had come as a result of her brother dying young. In the movie, Ramona wears one of her brother's shoelaces around her neck so that she can always remember him. Number 7. Beck wrote the songs for Sex for Bomb. The seven-time uh, Grammy winner Beck reached for his rhyming Beckionary, so penciled cool. garage rock numbers as Garbage Truck, Threshold, and Launchpad McQuack, that's not the actual title of the song, for Sex for Bomb to perform in the film. In a tribute to Beck's involvement in the movie, his acclaimed 1996 album Udalair can be seen when Scott and Knives are in the Sonic Boom record store. At this point, Scott takes the Clash of Demon Head album that Knives is considering buying and puts it back on the shelf in front of the Beck CD. Interestingly though, the Clash of Demon Head's own music was also provided by a real act, in this case Canadian indie rockers, Metric. Number 6. Shots from the film made it into the comic. O'Malley's Scott Pilgrim comics were picked up for a film adaptation almost as soon as they appeared. This meant that only the first two volumes were actually oh, publicly available <laughs> when Wright and Bacall began working on the script. With O'Malley consulting and feeding back on the script even as he was finishing the comic version, Wright has admitted that there are both lines that O'Malley came up with that were in the movie but never actually made it into the comic, and lines that Wright and Bacall wrote for the movie that O'Malley then lifted for his version. This is even the case with some of the visuals. Astro Boy. Some of the visuals. For example,
comes out of the shot in which Scott is defeated in his first fight with Gideon, and there's a caption with an arrow pointing to him simply saying, Dead, was a <laughs> shot conceived by Wright for the movie, but O'Malley liked it so much that an identical panel shows up in the comic as well. Ah, Number five, cool. Hardly anyone blinks. You'd really have to keep your eyes peeled to spot this one, but one of the stranger details about Scott Pilgrim is that there is barely any blinking in the movie at all. Taking a cue from O'Malley's wide-eyed manga art style, the movie mm. sought to capture a kind of anime feel in live action. While not going for full-on Elita-esque digital big eyes, Wright did in his own words. Elita's a good no movie too, quote, even though it kind of pissed me off. expressive faces and eyes you could get lost in, describing the movie as ocular porn. Wright wasn't content to simply cast the big-eyed actors, though. To really nail that anime look, he also insisted that the cast not blink as much as possible. Apparently, Alison Pill was the best at this. Number four, Ooh. Lucas Lee you stunned your eyes watering up, man. Real doubles. Relying on them to fight Scott in his place, Lucas Lee tells our hero that he's nothing without my stunt team. The same could be said for any real-life action star, including the one that plays Lucas right here. The joke in the film made me that while some of the Lucas likes genuinely resemble the actor they're doubling for, increasingly as they find out, they look with less and less convincingly <laughs> like the preening skateboarder or the real actor who plays him. But in reality, they were all genuinely Evans's real-world stunt team. Number three, the initial ending was ditched because it felt like a Transformers parody. With O'Malley not mm. having finished writing the books, Wright and Bacall had to come up with their own climactic showdown with Uber X Gideon. Given the anime and video game stylings of the rest of the movie, they settled on an obvious boss battle, Scott versus Mecha Gideon. Scenes were scripted and there were even storyboards and concept art for a sequence in which, after Scott beats Gideon for the first time, the latter's glasses would regenerate into a gigantic robotic Jason Schwartzman. However, Mecha Gideon didn't uh, quite fit like with how O'Malley envisioned the climax of his story panning out, and the comics writer described the concept as a bit too big and dumb. The last word on Mecha Gideon from Wright though was that, quote, we thought it would look like a Transformer spoof, so we ditched it. Number two, in the original ending, Scott gets together with knives. Oh. Mecha Gideon wasn't the only thing about the film's ending that changed as O'Malley wrapped up his own ending on the comic. In fact, a very different conclusion got as far as being shot and shown to test audiences. Not being very clear on which of the women Scott would actually end up with, Wright originally shot an ending in which Scott and Ramona apologize to each other and go their separate ways, with Scott realizing that Knives was the right girl for him all along. Test audiences did not respond well to this version though. Feeling let down by Scott fighting so much for Ramona, yeah, for Ramona? Then let her go. Weird. Seeking something less divisive, Wright reshot the ending with the version we know now, which conveniently tallied with how O'Malley would decide to end the comics. Number one, in a planned alternate ending, Scott was a serial killer. Not content with oh, okay. the Scott <laughs> that is knives random. Triangle, Wright also planned to shoot an ending where the veil of the colorful video game fantasy would have been dropped entirely and revealed that this was just the sociopathic Scott's method of processing the brutal murders of his crushes' seven exes. Wright has revealed that oh. he planned to use the movie's reshoots to film a news report on a Toronto serial killer and his horrific murders across the local music scene, which could then serve as a bleakly downbeat alternative coda to the otherwise bright movie. It was only the tight time frame for reshoots that prevented Wright from actually seeing this scene through. To be fair, this Canadian psycho ending was almost certainly never intended to be one that would give a nasty sting to the theatrically released version of Scott Pilgrim, and more likely was intended as a joke for home video. So that's our list. One, so you guys think down in the comments below. Did you know these Scott Pilgrim facts? And can you believe that this thing turns 10 years old? Come August, because I bloody well know I can't. Okay, so me personally, I didn't know any of that stuff. <laughs> it's been a while since I seen the movie. And just even thinking about it, I'm more surprised at seeing it again and seeing like some of the actors that were in it, like Brie Larson. I didn't know that was her. Um,. And then the girl that plays Knives, she looks so familiar, like I've seen her in something lately, but I can't think of what it is. So I am excited that it's a 10 year anniversary for the movie, so maybe I'll do like a live stream of me watching it. So what did you think? Did you know any of these things? Were you 
as shocked as I was, not really shocked, surprised as I was. <laughs> Leave a comment below. Thanks for watching. Oh, also don't forget to leave a comment, like, and subscribe, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.